morning, everyone. Um, today's reading will be from Exodus 24, verse 1 to 18, and Mark 9, from verse 1 to 13. Okay. From Exodus now. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the leaders of Is the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar, an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the, tables of the tablets of stone, and the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. And Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain and in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now from Mark 9. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth would bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw, saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He said to them, Elijah does come first, to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things, and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Good morning. Let us pray. Dear God of love, <clears throat> show yourself to us in a way that we can see. May we sense our hearts softening within us, 
as you whisper to the deepest parts of our souls. May we discover true spiritual safety and many companions to encourage us along our journey. May cultural noise not distract or intimidate us, but guide us closer to you, who understand what is beyond our understanding. May we dare to imagine something greater than this temporary world and be curious enough to uncover the riches of wisdom. May we come to love you who love us, you whom we do not yet see. May we be filled with glorious and expressible joy by what we receive from you. Lord, we bring to you our prayer request for the, for the tension in the Middle East. Many people in Israel are anxious. May the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob help resolve this deep conflict. The conflict between Israel and Iran is unmistakably evident in all seven fronts of the war that is Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu identified on the 26th of December 2023. Since then, cyber, legal and economic fronts can be added to Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Iran itself, Iraqi Shia militia, Yemen Houthi and the West Bank to make 10 fronts. We are living in a wobbly and unstable world right now, but God is still on the throne of the world and everything that happens is in his hands. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. But to do good and to distribute, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and by thy will they were created and have their being. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and on earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to St. James this morning. My name is Jacques and I am um, part of the pastoral team here at St. James and I trust that your time here this morning will be of great benefit to you um, as we draw um, together near to the Lord as we seek to be under His Word and be taught by His Word and spoken um, from His Word. So I pray that uh, our time together will be of great benefit to you this morning. We're going to continue our series in Mark chapter 9. So we're picking this up again and uh, we're kicking it off in Mark chapter 9. Um, what a passage to kick it off again. It's a hinge passage. It's a passage that uh, from this time forward Jesus is setting his sights on Jerusalem and he's heading towards Jerusalem. Um, it's an amazing passage to think about and I in one sense share my brother's <laughs> Chris too's, uh, thoughts and feeling towards this passage when I work through this passage when I consider it at one point I said your Lord this is a mystery this is amazing that something like this would happen that Jesus Christ would be transfigured on this mountain and the disciples are able to behold that and like Peter how do you respond to that how do you respond to something like that so I pray that our time will be um, in God's Word and that he will teach us from from God's Word there's a, so if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Mark chapter 9 and keep that open. There's tremendous joy in being a Christian. 
There's tremendous joy in knowing that the living God has set His favor upon you, has chosen to love you, is committed to you. There's tremendous joy in that. And that is why I think at times we are bombarded with um, all kinds of questions when we go through times of struggle, when times are difficult, when things don't pan out the way that we anticipated it would or that we expected it would or wanted, when things don't go as we expect. Often in times like that we are sort of pushed into a corner and then all these questions flood our minds and flood our hearts. Why is this happening to me? I don't understand. What's the purpose of this? I thought I was doing all things right. Where is God in all of this? Why is He permitting this to happen in my life? A few years ago, a Christian lady wanted to write an article for publication about Christians and their struggles. As she investigated various options, she came across a website of a well-known South African Christian magazine and read its policy concerning what they will and what they won't publish. It read in part as follows. You should avoid sending teaching articles, interviews, sermons. We are, however, always looking for miracles and healing testimonies. Now, to its credit, it requires that the testimonies be thoroughly researched, the healings needed to be documented medically. But this is such a picture for me of how many view the Christian life. It's a picture of what many people crave for in this world, what we crave for. We crave for success stories rather than stories of struggle and suffering. We crave for success stories and we avoid stories of struggle, stories of suffering. Now in our passage today we will see how the disciples try to avoid Jesus' words. Many of us, just like the disciples, we tend to be a bit selective in what we want to listen to from God's Word. We tune out the hard sayings of Jesus while we tune into the nice sayings of Jesus. But as Mark instructs us in this passage, we need to get a good look at Jesus and we need to listen to Him. We need to look up and we need to listen up. We need a biblical mature view of the Christian life. Because the so-called prosperity gospel is everywhere. It teaches you to expect health and wealth and prosperity. It's everywhere. But this passage contradicts such teachings. So a question I think worth asking yourself is how do I view the Christian life? Or what is my expectation of the Christian life? So please bow with me and let's ask the Lord's help as we consider His Word. Father, we want to thank You that we can gather together and gaze upon our Lord Jesus Christ through Your Word. Holy Spirit of God, please help us see Him more clearly and listen more eagerly. Like Peter, at one point he said, Lord, you have the words of life. Who else should we go to? Please, Lord, help us see you. Help us listen to you. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Right now, in our text, <clears throat> Jesus is transfigured. So verse 2, and after six days, Jesus took um, with him Peter, James, and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and Jesus was transfigured before them. Now this word transfigured, in the Greek, it's actually the word metamorphos. Metamorphos. That's a word that we are a little bit more used to, and you can feel of a butterfly and the, the whole process, right? That's what comes to mind when you hear the word metamorphos. Jesus visibly changed before them. Visibly changed before them. 
So this is something that God wants the disciples <clears throat> to see. He wants them to see what is happening with Jesus before them. For what reason? What would be God's reason for wanting the disciples to see this metamorphosis, this transfiguration of Jesus? Well, the immediate context gives us a clue regarding the significance of this incident, of this event. <clears throat> Look at verse 1. Sorry. <clears throat> And Jesus is speaking and, and he says to his disciples, verse 1, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. So they will see the transfiguration, which demonstrates the kingdom of God coming with power, intended for the benefit of Jesus' disciples. See, the disciples are given a glimpse now, as they are following Jesus, as, they, as Jesus is turning his, his gaze upon Jerusalem, they are getting a glimpse now of the kingdom of God coming in power. Verse, uh, chapter 8, end of chapter 8, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So they're getting a glimpse now of what will happen then. And that's when Jesus Christ will return with the kingdom in its fullness, with power, and the disciples now at this Mount of Transfiguration are getting a glimpse of what will happen then when Jesus returns. The sum standing here in verse 1 is immediately followed by Peter, James and John. Verse 2. So Jesus just said it. Some of you standing here will not taste death until you have seen the kingdom of God come in power. And it follows. He takes some of them. Peter, James and John up the mountain. Where he's going to be transfigured. And after six days, Caesarea Philippi, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And what they see is the kingdom of God coming in power. They get a glimpse of the divine power of the glory of Jesus. Verse 3, they see his appearance change. Mark tries to explain it, tries to gather words together. What he, what I mean, how do how do you how do you how do you try and explain that to someone? This metamorphosis that's happening to a man that they are touching and hearing and beholding. How do you explain it? So Mark tries, he gathers words together and he's led by God's Spirit to put these words on paper. And he tries to explain what it looks like. And it's very much home-like language, isn't it? His clothes became more radiant white than anyone ever could bleach them. In other words, it is white as white can be. Radiantly so. Verse 4, they see Elijah and Moses talking to Jesus. And their response, they are terrified. Verse 7, they see a cloud overshadow them. And they hear God's voice from the cloud. Verse 8, then suddenly all the cloud, Elijah, Moses, gone. And the only one left is Jesus. Now Jesus charges them in verse 9 to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Why would He say that to them? Well, I think it's because they did not get it. And they won't get it until the resurrection. And you can see that they didn't get it. When Peter asked a question about Elijah, verse 11. I mean, yes, the Mount of Transfiguration. And he's asking questions about Elijah. They were just too close, I think, to see the whole picture. Only after the resurrection will they be further removed to actually to understand, to see the whole picture. I guess it's like, you know, standing with your nose against a, 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 a painting. And, you, uh, and, you, and all you see is exactly what is in front of you. And if you are above age 45 and upwards, you, this is probably going to be a little bit out of focus for you. Right? And you get your spectacles that might need some, can give some aid. But you are up close and, and it just doesn't make sense. It's out of focus and it doesn't make sense. And so you've got to take a few steps back and like, oh, okay. Now I see what's going on here. I get a fuller picture of what's going on here. Only after the resurrection... Would it become clearer and make more sense to them? Now we are in a privileged position to be in an era post-resurrection 
and before the return of Christ. And we are in this era. So we are quite far removed to get a bit of a fuller picture of what's going on. And we are privileged to have the canon of Scripture before us. Canon of Scripture before us. And that helps us to take that step back, a few steps back, and try and see the bigger picture of what's going on here. And what we can see, and what they struggle to see, is how wonderfully this event, this Mount of Transfiguration, this event in Jesus' life parallels with what happened on another mountain in history, Mount Sinai. That's also a hinge passage, an event. Just like Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration is a hinge moment in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is turning his face to Jerusalem, Mount of Transfiguration is a hinge moment in the Torah where the people of Israel are turning their face to the Promised Land and are heading down. Hinge moment. So the Exodus, particularly Exodus 24, that passage, is a critical backdrop for the Transfiguration. Moses, with three men, <clears throat> goes up Mount Sinai. God's glory comes down in a cloud. God's voice is heard from the cloud. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was <clears throat> like a devouring fire. Moses reflects the glory of God in his face. And all of, so all of these little details that you see are present here in Mark chapter 9. The high mountain, three men with Jesus, God's glory in the cloud, <clears throat> God speaking from the cloud, Jesus' appearance changing, Moses himself appearing with Elijah, Elijah who also met with God at Mount Sinai when he was struggling inwardly and he was hiding in a cave. They both appear. Even a reference to the six days in verse 2 are intentional. After six days, God spoke from the cloud on Mount Sinai. After six days, Jesus goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and the cloud comes and God speaks from the cloud. So when you take a step back and you see this, then you would conclude, oh my goodness, this is Mount Sinai all over again. So that would be a natural conclusion. But take a few more steps back. Don't just look at the parallels, but take a few more steps back and look at the differences. So whenever you come across such parallels within Scripture, what Scripture is inviting you to do is, is to recognize and compare the parallels and learn from that, but also to look at the differences that you see. So when you see the differences, when you begin to see the differences, you begin to see the uniqueness of Jesus. So what are the most obvious differences? Or differences. Well, one, they are not on Mount Sinai. They are on another mountain. So here they meet with Jesus, but not on Mount Sinai. This is a most obvious difference that you recognize here. Why? Because this is not Mount Sinai all over again. Second, Moses reflects God's glory at Mount Sinai when he comes down. So at Mount Sinai, Moses saw the glory of God and even reflected it in his face. Exodus 34 verse 39 tells it in this way. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Jesus, however, does not simply reflect the glory of God. And this is the significant difference. He doesn't merely reflect the glory of God like Moses did. He is the glory of God of God. The transfiguration shows that He, Jesus, is God. He produces glory. He is the source and it emanates from Him. Hebrews 1 verse 3 puts it in this way. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is God in the flesh, God the Son, and radiantly so. So when Jesus asked His disciples in the previous chapter, in Mark chapter 8 verse 29, Who do you say I am? Peter's response showed that he, he, saw, he started to grasp who Jesus is. You are the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the one who came to save us. You're the Messiah that we have been longing for, that we are waiting for, that we are praying for, that the Old Testament are pointing to. We are looking for this one. You are the one. 
Yet he, he still had a far way to go. He still had to take a few steps back to see the whole picture. He still had a far way to go. And you see that in what happens next. Peter <coughs> proposes to the transfiguration that he sees. He wants to teach him how to build a tent. <laughs> he, to make, he put up three tents. One for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you, Jesus. But Mark, like a side comment here, makes this comment. He says, Peter didn't really know what he was saying. I mean, what would you do? He didn't really know what he's saying. And he was terrified. They were terrified. See, Peter was missing something. And a voice from the cloud will make clear what Peter was missing. The cloud overshadowed him. Verse 7. <clears throat> and God the Father speaks. Audible voice. And in Mark's gospel, this is the second time God's audible voice is heard. The first time was at Jesus' baptism. Very similar, but also different. At Jesus' baptism, the Father said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. At the Mount of Transfiguration, here the Father says, This is my beloved Son. Listen to Him. So in both cases, Jesus is identified as the Father's beloved Son. What are the differences? One, at the baptism, the Father speaks directly to Jesus. You are my beloved Son. In you I'm well pleased. At the transfiguration, the Father speaks directly to the disciples. This is my beloved Son. So all that is happening at the Mount of Transfiguration is for the disciples' benefit. Why? Because what God wants them to see is that Jesus is His beloved Son. Yes, Peter, he is the Messiah. Yes, he is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the one that you longed for, that you've been praying for, that Israel has been waiting for. Yes, he is. But don't miss it. This is my beloved son. He's my son. The second difference is what is added to those statements. At the baptism, the Father's voice states his, I, Jesus' identity and his satisfaction. This is my beloved son. So, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Here at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Father's voice gives a statement of identity. This is my beloved son. But then he gives a command. Listen to this one. Listen to him. Now, many explanations are given for the presence of Moses and Elijah with Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. One of the explanations is uh, who they represent or what they represent. So Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets and the prophetical writings. So it is right and it is good for us to take their writings seriously and consider them as God's authoritative word. For they spoke and they wrote from God. So when you read the Old Testament, you take it as authority. It's God's word. And it's right for us to do so. However, the significant difference is that what they spoke and what they wrote about is fulfilled in this one. In Jesus. Who speaks as God. This is my beloved son. He speaks as God. So on the mountain, God speaks from the cloud. But in the incarnation, God taking on flesh, Jesus. And the voice of the incarnate God, Jesus, is the voice of God. Therefore, listen to him. He's the only way, one that can say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Because he speaks as God. But why would God at this particular point want to emphasize this reality for the disciples? Why emphasize at this point in their journey, in Jesus' life, their need to listen to Jesus? Well, what has Jesus been saying to them recently? Turn back with me to the previous chapter, chapter 8, verse 31. And he, that's Jesus, began to teach them 
He's speaking. He's teaching them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, teaching them plainly. See, this is the first of three occasions in Mark where Jesus carefully explained the cost and meaning of being the Messiah. To suffer. To suffer. And when that is applied to the Messiah, it is a theological shorthand, if you will, for his death upon the cross. But to suffer many things, as here, includes far more than his actual death on the cross. Hebrews 5 verse 8 makes it clear that the cross was the culmination and the climax of a life of suffering of Jesus. And it culminated at the cross. He must suffer many things, be rejected and killed. But, when he, but he will rise again. And the next two explanations that Jesus gives of his suffering, rejection, his death and uh, and his resurrection is found in Mark chapter 9 verse 31 and 10 verse 33 which gradually give a fuller picture as the disciples are starting to step back and seeing the fuller picture and they can grow in their understanding but they still won't get it until the resurrection but at this point after Jesus first taught about his suffering what does Peter do Peter takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him. And Jesus turning to the rest of the disciples in verse 33 of chapter 8, that suggests that all of the disciples share in Peter's rebuke of Jesus. Their concept of the Messiah, their view of Jesus is that he will be a conquering savior, but the military savior as such. He will not, he cannot be a suffering servant. This is not what we sign up for. This is not what our expectations are of the Messiah. How can he say this? I'm going to rebuke him. And then the transfiguration. In the midst of all of that, in the midst of that context, the transfiguration and the voice from the cloud. Look, Peter, James, John, look. Behold, this is my beloved son. He is more than what you expected. He is more than what you think. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. His word is authoritative. He speaks as God. And what he is telling you is the plan of your salvation, Peter. Is the plan of your salvation, James, John, disciples, us. It's the plan of your salvation. Listen to him. Your salvation will cost my son his life. He is going to take your rejection of God, your rebellion towards God, your indignation towards Him, your criticisms, your hatreds towards Him, your indifference towards Him, your abhorrence of Him. He is going to take it. He is going to take your desire to have no God in this world. He is going to take it. He is going to take your quest for autonomy. He's going to take your desire to be your own God and king of your own world and king of your own life. He's going to take it. He's going to take it upon himself. All of that. And he will bear it as if he is the guilty one. And he's going to die with that as the judgment of God is poured out on him for our sins. For our rebellion, for our quest of autonomy, for our criticisms, for the way we treat God, for the way we treat people. He's going to bear it upon himself on the cross and he's going to bear the judgment of God, take it in our place and he's going to die. It's the plan of your salvation, Peter. Listen to him. I said earlier on that they did not get it. And you could see that they didn't get it by them asking about Elijah in verse 11. Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? 
You, got, you sort of get the sense that Peter's dodging what's going on here. Or he might have experienced God's voice from the cloud as a rebuke. He said, I don't want to be rebuked again. Let me talk about Elijah rather. I'm not 100% sure. But they may be thinking. We know Elijah will return before the great day when the Messiah will put everything right. We just saw Elijah. Okay. So isn't it time? I mean, why are we talking about death and resurrection? Should we not be talking about what the Messiah will do? Restoration, conquer, rule. Why talk about Jesus? Why talk about death? Why talk about resurrection? They struggled to get it. But Jesus will continue to help connect the dots for them. And it shows that their question about Elijah is not a separate subject, not a separate issue. Yes, Elijah will come, verse 12. But when he asked them, how is it written about the Son of Man that he should suffer many things, he's connecting the dots. When Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man, he uses it as a reference to himself. Jesus is connecting the dots of the coming Elijah with the dots of his own suffering. The truth is, verse 13, Elijah has come and he did suffer. And Jesus is essentially saying Elijah was handed over and suffered. Why does it surprise you, Peter? Why does it surprise you, James, John, the rest of the disciples? Why does it surprise you that I'm going to follow the same road? I'm heading down the same road. Why does it surprise you? Now, interestingly enough, no single text in the Bible says Elijah would suffer. But Elijah, remember, represents the prophets, the messengers of God. And the general pattern in Scripture of the prophets was persecution and suffering. So, and Jesus picks up on this again later on in Mark chapter 12 when he ha highlights this by portraying Israel as the tenants of a vineyard who keep rejecting and killing the messengers who are sent by the owner. And at last the owner sends his beloved son and he says to himself that they will respect my son. But what do they do? They kill the son. One of the last prophets to come before the beloved son is John the Baptist. And he suffered and he was executed. Why Peter? Why James? Why John? Why does it surprise you that I'm going down the same road? I've got to teach you about my suffering, about my death, about my resurrection. I'm going down the same road, but it's a plan of your salvation. What are your expectations of me? How do you view me? See, here's the thing. The heavenly glory of the transfiguration is in striking contrast to what Jesus taught about his suffering in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And this means that the transfiguration the counterbalances for us the gloom of Jesus' death and suffering. So in other words, yes, life is not going to be easy. Life is going to be difficult. It is going to be hard. But the glimpse of glory we see in Jesus gives us a foretaste of the glory to come. Glory is certain. It was certain for Jesus and it showed itself at the Mount of Transfiguration. It is certain for those who have trusted in Him and following Him. And we're going to go down the same road. But glory is coming. It's certain. It is through the death and it is through the resurrection of Jesus. So following Jesus will bring much joy into this world. Being a Christian is joyous. Knowing that the Father has placed His favor upon you because of your faith in Jesus. It's joyous. But there will also be struggles. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. You cannot have one without the other. Glory comes through the death and resurrection. Glory comes through suffering. And seeing the parallels to the Old Testament Sinai, 
helps us understand the significance of the events on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is God's Son, the fulfillment of Scripture, God's glory, who is ushering in His kingdom. Therefore, listen to Him. This is our challenge, though, isn't it? To listen to Him. To continue to listen to Jesus, whose voice echoes throughout the pages of Scripture, reminding us of the necessity and the importance of His suffering and His death and His resurrection, the necessity of His cross and an empty grave. But also the hope and encouragement that the transfiguration provides. A glimpse of glory that awaits those who listen to Him. Who else can we go to, Lord? Says Peter. I think he's learned his lesson at some point. Who else can we go to, Lord? You have the words of life. Who else? We're going to end by praying. But um, at the door you would have received a prayer card. <coughs> How can we pray for you? And we want to encourage you to just take two minutes... Take a moment, um, just fill in your details for us, if you don't mind, um, and then just write a short prayer request. We would love to pray for you. If you want to um, not write in your details, you want to uh, just give us the prayer request, that's absolutely fine too, but we would love to get your details as well to follow up and ask how the Lord, how we, how we can continue praying for you. But why don't you just take two minutes, fill in your details. Write something that you are praying about or it's something that's on your heart or some, something that you would want us to pray for as a staff and we would love to do that. Um, so why don't you please take two minutes. You should have received the pen as well and a card. Take two minutes and just write down your details and a prayer <clears throat> and then I'll close for us in prayer. I'm going to close for us in prayer. You're welcome to continue writing <clears throat> if you're still busy. But let's just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, you have the words of life. You are God, God incarnate, the Son of God. You gave us a glimpse of your glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. We could see something as we look at you through Scripture with Peter, James and John. It was for their benefit, it was for our benefit. <clears throat> but Lord, how striking it is to me that you would say, my place of glory was not so much the, trans the amount of transfiguration, but it was the cross. When you prayed, now the glory of God will be revealed as you stretch out your arms. That is our glorious day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've accomplished for us. Thank you for taking up on yourself our sinfulness. And thank you for bearing upon yourself our judgment, our punishment, so that we can be free to follow you. Life, Lord, as we go through life and we face the struggles and the sufferings, and help us remember that glory is coming. And help us lean into you in moments like that and rest in you. And we pray that you will grant us strength to endure. Lord, many of us has written some prayer requests on these cards. We want to commit it to you. And we pray, Lord, in your goodness and according to your will, won't you please answer. For your glory's sake and even for our good, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.